a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so this paper is called Sentiment and Speculation in a Market with Hedgeous Beliefs. And uh, it's joint with uh, Dimitris Papadimitriou, who's at, at King's College London. Um, so the, the basic idea of this paper is extremely simple. Um, and it's so simple, I can just outline it on a single slide. Um, I'm going to show you a model with a bunch of agents um, who have different beliefs. Um, and they're going to disagree about the likelihood of, of getting good or bad news. Um, and so because they disagree, they're going to take different positions in the market. So optimists are going to go long and uh, pessimists are going to go short. Uh, and what that means is that if, for whatever reason, the market turns out to rally, uh, the optimists will get relatively rich. And if the market sells off, the pessimists will get relatively rich. And so whatever happens, the price is going to, you know, the money is going to flow to the people who look smart in hindsight, whether that's by, by luck. Uh, or by good judgment. And so the prices looking forward will then sort of preferentially embed the beliefs of these ex post winners. So on the upside, the optimists will pump the market up even higher than it would otherwise have gone. Uh, and if you get bad news, the pessimists will drive the market even further than it, even further down than it would otherwise have gone. And so in other words, this sentiment effect is going to create volatility uh, and it's going to induce people to speculate. Uh, in other words, you know, they're going to, people are going to want to trade at prices that they don't really believe are justified by fundamentals in the long run because they think that there are short run advantages to speculation. Okay. So this is, you know, there's, there's an absolutely massive literature that I am not going to even attempt to summarize um, today. Um, I think the one, in some ways, a lot of the, the what we're going to talk about is beautifully described in a, in a uh, Keynes' general theory. Um, the paper, I guess I will single out, is a extremely nice paper by John Jadokoplos, uh, The Leverage Cycle, um, uh, whose framework we essentially almost entirely steal uh, from Jadokoplos. I'm going to make one very small change to the basic framework, which is going to have very big implications in terms of how we can solve the model, uh, and we'll be able to do much more with our model than Genocopus could do with this for reasons that I will explain. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to describe, I've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to describe the model to you quite quickly and then just go through a, a, a couple of examples that hopefully will, will, um, will help to bring out the basic flavor of, of, our, of our framework. But I should say that I, I, my hope is this framework is, ex, is extremely tractable. So I'm going to show you lots and lots of pictures of things moving around. Everything is basically in closed form in the paper, and we do everything with pencil and paper rather than numerically. And so my hope is that this is a kind of a modular framework that you can ideally slot into a, some macro model or, or, or whatever you like. Okay, so we're going to have a, basically a continuum of investors. Each person is going to be endowed with one unit of a risky asset, which you can think of as being the market. Um, and this asset itself, is, the uncertainty is going to evolve along a binomial tree. Uh, with some number of periods, and at the final period, there are just exogenously given terminal payoffs. And these are going to be basically completely arbitrary for us. They can be whatever you like. They have to be positive, but other, other than that, they can be anything you like. And so we've got a continuum, continuum of people who are indexed by their type H, which is between, strictly between zero and one. And if you're person H, then you think that the probability of an up move that every single node of this big binomial tree is H. So if I'm Mr. 0 0.5, then at every node of this tree, I think it's a 50-50 chance of going up and a 50-50 chance of going down. So in other words, the people whose H is close to one are the kind of optimists who think it's likely to always trickle, to diffuse upwards through the tree. If H is close to zero, then you're a pessimist who thinks you're going to go down through the tree. Um, Investors have got log utility over terminal wealth, so there's no intermediate consumption. They have log utility, and we're just going to normalize the interest rate to zero. So basically, the, all these assumptions are straight. This is a, everything is straight out of uh, Janikopoulos, with the one exception that we have log utility where Janikopoulos had risk neutral uh, agents. And that, that's going to have two effects. First of all, of course, we're going to be able to talk about risk premium in our setting because people are, our people are risk averse. Um, secondly, and possibly surprisingly, you, you might expect that risk neutrality 
would make things easier for gender car plus. But actually, in an important way, it makes things much more complicated with his setting, which means that when he solves his model, he can only handle two periods, everything is numerical. It's a beautiful paper, but it's, sort of, it's just very, very hard to work with his model. Um, the, the problem with risk neutrality is that risk neutral investors are basically psychopathically aggressive. Uh, they really want to trade extremely aggressively on their beliefs. And so to get an equilibrium, you have to constrain them by imposing short sales constraints. And so when you have a short sales constraint, then effectively you have a, basically a kink in your indirect utility function. And that kink makes everything extremely intractable. And so that's the sort of, you know, so actually by adding risk aversion, not only do we get to think about things like risk premium, which we're interested in anyway, but also everything becomes beautifully tractable. We can handle arbitrary many periods. We have lots of like nice theoretical results as, as you'll see. Uh, and just in, you know, for today and for most of the paper in fact as well, I'm just gonna assume that there's no learning. So even if you, if you observe a thousand consecutive up moves, you're still gonna stick to your, I would still stick to my belief that it's a 50-50 chance of going up or down. Um, in the paper, we, we, we have some results with learning and the, the sort of punchline is that that seems to sort of make all our results even stronger. Uh, okay. So, you know, in principle, we can think about the belief distribution. So the, the, the distribution of these types H being completely arbitrary. We have like, the arbitrary case in the paper. For today, you will not lose much by just thinking about the uniform case where everyone, there's an equal number of people of all the different types between zero and one. Um, it's actually convenient you know, for, for some of our continuous time limits that I'm going to show you to handle general beta distributions um, where these parameters alpha and beta are just arbitrary positive parameters that you, what, what you can fix. But as I say, you don't lose much by just thinking of alpha and beta is equal to one. But of course, the beta distribution family in general allows us to think about all sorts of issues with left skewed beliefs, right skewed beliefs, more or less disagreement, and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to give you about maybe five slides of the model um, before I get to the examples. And as you'll see, it's basically extremely simple. That's the, that's the nice thing about this, this, uh, this basic setup. Um, so, you know, here's the tree that you can imagine yourself living on. Here are these terminal payoffs, which are exogenous. Um, and the pricing problem is to work out in equilibrium what the price is going to be at time zero. Of this, of this asset. In fact, not only at time zero, but at every other node through the tree. So then you can think about how, what happens to its volatility uh, and so on. And the beauty of, of course of log utility is that everything's extremely simple because log investors are myopic. In other words, they have this property that you could just think of them as looking one period ahead at any point in time. And so what that means is that we can reduce this tree, essentially we can at least consider a sub problem, which is, in this blue circle, let's suppose that we know the price is going to be PU or PD tomorrow, and we're just going to work out what the price has got to be in equilibrium today. And if we can solve that sort of sub subtree, then of course you can just do backward induction throughout the whole tree, starting from the you know second last day and working backwards, and then then you're done. So that's going to be the tactic now. So the the, the, the kind of game now is given PU and PD, which you take as given what in equilibrium should P be? That's the next, that's the first challenge. Okay, and we're just gonna solve this in the absolutely classic sort of micro, undergrad micro way of doing things, which is you start from the perspective of the individual little agent who sees, who lives in this world, who solves their optimization problem, decides how much of the asset to hold. And then in stage two, you're gonna close the market by requiring aggregate supply equals aggregate demand and that will pin down the price. Okay, so now, so now you should put yourself in the shoes of this individual person, uh, your person H, you've got some amount of cash WH, and the, the problem for you is how many units of this asset do you wanna hold? Given that it's trading at a price of P, which as a small individual, you take P as given for now. Okay, so this is your portfolio of choice problem. You maximize your expected utility, and of course the, probabilities you're using depend on who you are. So if I'm person H, 
This is the probability of an up move. And in the upstate, my utility is going to be the log of my wealth in the upstate. Similarly, then in the downstate, I've got the probability of a downstate times the log of my wealth in the downstate. And just to see why this is the wealth in the, in the upstate, imagine that you buy XH units of this asset. Well, that'll cost you XH times P. So the cash you have left over is this man here that I'm highlighting. You take that cash, you put it in the bank, earning the riskless rate. But of course, the riskless rate we've normalized to zero. So you just get the money back. So this is the, you can imagine if you like, in general, multiplying this by the, by, uh, the gross risk, the gross riskless interest rate. This is your cash in the bank. And then, of course, you have your XH units. And if you get good news, that, that XH units will be worth XH times PU. Similarly, on the downside, again, you get your cash in the bank and you have the, the realized payoff of your position in the risky asset. And this has a very straightforward first order condition, which looks like this. And by the way, you can already see, even from this first order condition, you can see certain things come out already. For example, imagine you're someone who's extremely optimistic. So your H is almost one. Well, then the second term goes away. And so you're going to end up with something positive. Right? Because P is always going to lie between PD and PU by no arbitrage. Similarly, if you're extremely pessimistic, if H is almost zero, then the first term goes away and you have something negative. So what this tells you is that there's always going to be some people who are long and some people who are short. At every node of the tree. So it's when somebody's long and somebody's short. Okay, so <clears throat> um, it, you know, it, it's sort of helpful throughout the whole paper to, to, to move flexibly between prices and risk neutral probabilities. Um, obviously, it's a very familiar move in sort of der derivatives and so on. So I'm going to call the risk neutral probability of an up move H star. And of course, that's defined by this basic property that the price is the risk neutral expected payoff. And there's no time discounting because the riskless rate is, is one, is zero. Okay, now, and of course, it, it's sort of stating the obvious, but just to emphasize it, although the, the true probability of an up move is not an objective quantity because everyone disagrees on it, of course, everyone has to agree on the risk neutral probability of an up move because that's something you can objectively observe through prices. Okay, and so you know, this is very convenient. It makes everything look very nice and simple. For example, if you, having worked out the optimal investment on the previous slide, you can work out what the realized return on wealth is gonna be for each agent. And it takes a nice simple form. And the key thing is that for each agent, or the returns of different agents are proportional. If you get an up move, it's proportional to H. If you get a down move, it's proportional to one minus H. So what this means is that after diffusing through this binomial tree for a while, if you've gone, let's say, up m times and down n times, person h's wealth is going to be h to the power of m times 1 minus h to the power of n multiplied by some constant. And the important thing here is that this constant here is the same for all the different agents. For example, every time you get an up move, every agent picks up a factor of H star, but that's the same for all the different agents. And then finally, don't forget that they all start with the same endowment times zero. So they all have initial wealth, which is the same. So this thing here is just some constant independent of H. And then you can pin that down just by observing that aggregate wealth is equal to P, right? because the only asset in positive supply is the risky asset and it's in unit supply. So when you integrate this thing here with respect to H, that thing must equal P. And aggregate wealth equals P. And that pins it down as an expression in terms of um, so the lambda path is, is all this stuff, is this stuff here. It's a ratio basically of beta functions. And if you haven't recently played with beta functions, just think of this as being like a ratio involving lots of factorials. You know, alpha factorial, beta factorial, and so on. So for example, at, at, at any given node, after m ups and n downs, you can ask yourself, who is the richest person? So in other words, you can just maximize this expression with respect to h. And what you find is, a, is that after m ups and n downs, the richest person is this person here. This is the person who looks really smart because this person is just a really smart person. So if you've had seven up moves and three down moves, then the richest person is the person whose h is equal to 0 
who was proved right ex post. And just to show you in a picture, you know, um, uh, you know, imagine a very, very simple case. So you start at time zero, everyone has equal wealth. Then let's say you've got a down move. What's going to happen? Well, the wealth is going to shift quite dramatically towards the pessimists. Because these are the people who are going short and ex post they turn out to be right. And so they make lots of money. On the other hand, these idiots up here were very, very bullish. They were levering up quite a lot and they lose almost all their money. They didn't lose all of it, of course, because they have log utility, so they will endogenously avoid bank bankruptcy, but they lose a lot of money. If you then get an up move to down, then up, then now these people, these people also almost blow up completely. And the people who are more moderate in the middle are now doing best. Then if you get a second up move, you know, you, you go to this sort of orangish, reddish line here, where the richest person of all is the person whose H is equal to two thirds, who looks very smart in hindsight. And so this is the basic uh, dynamic that's that's going on in, in the world. Okay, so so far I've just all I've done is just like what the individual. So actually, let me let me go back a second. So the fact that we can track the wealth distribution throughout a tree is a kind of a big, it's a hugely important thing for this model. And you know, in, in these heterogeneous agent models in general, my casual impression is that tracking the wealth distribution or the moment of the wealth distribution is a big problem. Um, and so for us in this setting, everything is like beautifully simple, um, which makes everything go through very nicely. Okay, so that's the, 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 the micro problem. Now we do the macro piece, which is the market clearing. So we've now worked out what each individual agent's demand for the asset is as a function of the price which the take is given. And now we clear the market. So now you basically integrate XH with respect to H, and, the and that gives you the total demand at price P for the asset. And of course, total demand must equal total supply, which is one. And so then finally, you end up with a, an equation you can solve for P, um, and, and here it is. So now we've sort of finished doing the little blue circle in that diagram. We've done the, the problem of given PU and PD, we've worked out what the price P has to be. And in a sense, the, the, the beauty of the log utility is that, you know, when I say you have to do this integral, you know, one can do that integral and it's tractable, and then you can then solve the resulting equation and that's also tractable. So, so getting to here is, you know, the log utility is extremely helpful here. Okay, and so now what we have basically is like a, this thing here is basically a backwards updating equation that you can now use in principle just to go back through the tree you, you, uh, by backward induction from these exogenous terminal ones. Um, we also have a, a sort of a general formula if you want to do it all in one step, just in terms of these terminal payoffs, just to price the thing at time zero in one go, we have this nice, nice formula where these coefficients, again, are just, these are the binomial coefficients and these are ratios of beta functions. So again, this is like a, basically like a, a complicated ratio of factorials of various different things. And by the way, I should have said more clearly, I always use M to mean the number of up moves. So PMT is the price or the payoff at time capital T conditional on M up moves having taken place in total. Okay, that's the first result. And then the second result, which I'm gonna show through some examples is that we can characterize when sentiment drives the price up and when sentiment drives the price down. So that's a, the fact that sentiment has these ambiguous effects is very much stressed by Keynes, for example, in his general theory. Uh, but a lot of recent, you know, Jenna Coppers' paper, Harrison Kreps, Shankman Zhang, all these papers have short sales constraints. So they naturally generate bubbles, but not, not uh, sentiment never drives the price down in those models. So in our, in our setting, you can get both. And in fact, we have a nice characterization of when you get one and when you get the other. Okay. So, <clears throat> so given everything I've told you so far, it's very easy to work out things like the, the risky share of person H. So in other words to say, if, if I'm Mr. 50-50, what fraction of my cash will I put into the risky asset? What fraction will I put into the, uh, the, the, the bank? And it has a nice simple expression, again, in terms of who I am, H, a little, sorry, this little H here. It also depends on the H star, which is the risk neutral probability, and on this thing, capital H, 
which is a takes a nice simple form. And both H star and capital H have this very nice interpretation. First of all, this quantity here, capital H, this is the person, if you happen to be the person whose, whose H is equal to capital H, so if, if little h equals big H, then your risky share equals one. So in other words, you're the person who's putting all your money into the market. You're not levering up. You're not putting any money in a bank. You're just holding the market. So you're, you're in, the, in the kind of Warren Buffett terminology, you're Mr. Market. If you happen to be the person who, whose belief is equal to the risk neutral probability, then you're completely out of the market. So if H equals H star, then your risky share is zero. So you're not short, you're not long, you're, you're all in cash. You're like a bond investor. And so you should kind of visualize as a spectrum of people from the extreme optimists to the extreme pessimists. And then in between, you've got the kind of the, the all cash investor here and then the rep agent here. And then in between, you've got the balanced people who have some cash, some bonds, sorry, some cash, some risky assets. Here, you've got the people who are levering up. Here, you've got the people who are short. And the distinctive feature about this model is that the identities of these people are constantly shifting around as you get good or bad news. So the person who's represented today will not be represented tomorrow. So that's, that's the sort of key thing. So who Mr. Market is will depend on what happens. And let me show you a simple example just to make, bring that point. Um, just, you know, the numbers are not important. This is just, uh, you know, the terminal payouts are just doubling as you go up. Um, this is uniform belief to keep everything very simple. And what you see here in red is the prices that would prevail in a homogeneous world where everyone thinks there's a 50-50 chance of going up or down. So in a homogeneous world, price is one initially, it goes up to one and a half or down to three quarters, um, and then the world ends. So with heterogeneity, the price is a little bit lower initially. Mr. Market is the, mean, the median investor right, initially. And the person who's out of the market, the all cash investor, is the person whose belief is 0.29. So kind of a pessimistic person. There's only a 29% chance of going up. If you're more pessimistic than that, you'll be short initially. So now suppose you get good news. Well, then the price moves up quite a lot. So there's a big price run up because the money is flowing to the people who are optimistic. The person who previously was, was the representative investor is now going to see this new high price and think, wow, the market's gone up too much. And so it's going to be, this person is now going to put all their money in cash. So they get out of the market completely. And then the new Mr. Market is much more bullish. So Mr. M Mr. Market, this sort of hypothetical Warren Buffett figure, gets more optimistic when you get good news. On the downside, of course, the opposite happens. The price goes down more. Uh, the person who previously was representative is now more bullish than the representative investor. So we'll now be levering up to get into them, into this asset, to buy it, to lever up to buy it at prices that he thinks are, are extremely attractive because the price has been driven down by these pessimists. And the person who previously was out of the market will get in, will have some cash, some bond. Sorry, some cash, some risky asset. Okay. Uh, okay. So just to summarize, um, <clears throat> I'm going to summarize some of the things that are um, objectively perceived and things which are objective. So for example, in this world, there's no objective measure of the risk premium. Everyone has their own opinion in this world. If you're person H, this is the risk premium you, that you perceive. So it has a nice simple form, but it depends on who you are. It depends on your own age. But of course, they have to agree on things that are objectively measurable. So risk neutral quantities, for example. So here, for example, is risk neutral variance. Right? This does not depend on H, on little h. Um, they agree on the level of VIX index, which again, you can compute in closed form. You can sort of think about either of these two quantities, risk neutral variance or VIX. Both of these things essentially are measuring, this thing here is actually the, the relative entropy of, the, of H with respect to H star, capital H with respect to the H star. So what it's measuring is basically the gap, how, how much disagreement there is between the person who's all in the market and the person who's all in bonds. So the further apart capital H and H star are, the higher the VIX is in equilibrium in our model. And I'll come back to that in a bit later. 
Now, one thing you might notice uh, after you spend a while staring at all these things is that I told you earlier that the risky share of person H takes this form. And if you look at this expression here and this expression here, you'll see that this can be reinterpreted as the risky share is the risk premium that you personally perceive scaled by objectively measured risk neutral variance. Um, so this is a little bit similar to a sort of Mertonian formula with gamma equal to one for log investors, but with risk neutral variance appearing on the bottom, which is sort of nice because that's an objective thing. Now, one thing that that means is that in our model, the risky share of missed, sorry, the risk premium perceived by Mr. Market, in other words, the person, the person who has risky share equal to one must perceive a risk premium that's equal to risk neutral variance. So what that, the, what that means is that in our setting, this thing that I've called SVIX in other, in previous papers, forecasts the risk premium that's perceived by Mr. Market. And, and in particular, it'll mean that when we, do, I'll show you a very, very sort of stylized calibration. It'll mean that it's quite easy for the model to generate plausible first and second moments of, of market returns um, in equilibrium. Okay. Um, so I, I'm now going to show you a, a, an extremely stylized example, which hopefully brings across the, um, the basic mechanism in a really stark way. So, so imagine this actually is an example, again, from Janikoplos. He considered this example but with only two periods. So now imagine there's 50 periods. It's a big binomial tree. And let's say beliefs are uniform, just to keep things simple. And you're pricing a risky bond. So this risky bond pays you 100 in every state of the world, apart from the nightmare scenario where you get 50 consecutive down moves. So at the very bottom state, you only get, let's say, 30 recovery value. Now, obviously, reasonable people do not think this bond is going to default. So if you're the median investor, uh, you think the probability of default is 2 to the power of minus 50, which is a very, very small number. Uh, um, even if you're extremely pessimistic, so you're like in the 90th percentile of pessimism, so you think that every, down, every node there's a 90% chance of going down, even that person doesn't think that it's likely to, to default because 0.9 to the power of 50 is still a very, very small number. And so only the total crazy people actually think that this thing is like to default. Now, initially at time zero, this person's a representative agent. This is Mr. Market. And so you should, I, let's allow you to think in your own mind just for a second, what price you might expect this bond would trade at. Um, and bear in mind, of course, that the risk risk rate is zero. Right? So there's no, if this thing was genuinely riskless, it would just trade at 100. Now, what price does it actually trade at? Well, it trades at, um, you know, a price that I think, when I first saw this, seems very surprising at first sight. This low price is 95.63. Now, I told you at the very, very beginning, maybe it's the first slide of all, there's always some people who go short, some people who go long. And you might say, okay, fine, if it's, the price is so low, who on earth would go short at such a low price? And the answer is that lots of people will go short at this, at this low price. Um, for almost half of the population will be getting short of this price, at least initially, like at least at time zero. There's a different question, is who's going to go short and who will stay short? Uh, and to answer that question, you have to ask who is the marginal person, who is the, who is the cash investor in each period? So at time zero, we've just seen the cash investor is H is 0.48. But if you keep getting bad news, the identity of the cash investor so this is the cutoff between the longs and the shorts is going down. So, you know, after, um, let's suppose that I am, let's suppose that I am, my H is 0 0.25. So I think there's a probability of default of less than one in a million. Well, in that case, I'll be short at time zero. I will stay short at time one. But if I get another piece of bad news, I will reverse my position and go long. Because by that point, I think, wow, these people who are even more pessimistic than me have driven the price so far down that even I, as a pessimist, think that they've gone too far. Okay, and so only the people who are really very, very extreme are going to actually stay short to the very, very end. But, of course, if they get there, these people would have made an absolute fortune. Okay, so let me, let me show you the, the, the price path um, over these 
50 periods, assuming that you keep getting bad news, right? So obviously at the end, if you've got 50 periods, you, you end up with this recovery value of 30. At time zero, you've got this 95, 63. And in between, you get this path that looks like this. Now, imagine that you're the median investor. Of course, you, you think that the probability of ending up down here is this astronomically small number, two to the minus 50. But even so, you think that the price today, 9563, is, is reasonable. That's the fair price. You are Mr. Market. You don't want to lever up. And the reason you think this is the fair price is because in the short run, tomorrow, if there's bad news, the people who are more pessimistic than you are going to drive the market down. And so in the short run, there's a lot of volatility created by the sentiment. And that is what causes you to back off um, as, a, as a moderate investor. Um, and so you get this big qualitative difference in the heterogeneous world than what you get in the homogeneous world, where you know, this was my casual expectation when I first looked at this example. I thought the price would be 99.99999. You know, in a homogeneous world, the price is basically 100 until very shortly before the end when suddenly everyone realizes, you know, oh my God, it could actually happen. And suddenly the price falls off a cliff. But there's a big kind of qualitative separation between the homogeneous and the heterogeneous world. Um, another thing you can do is just um, is you can look at the, the how people position themselves, how they choose to trade. Again, it's assuming you get bad news constantly. I mean, by the way, if you ever get good news, of course, a single piece of good news, the price will instantly jump to 100 and stay there forever, because then you know that the, the bond will pay out. So here we are. So this is a position held by all these different people. So here is the median agent, the purplish line. So initially, this person holds one unit of the asset because they're Mr. Market. If you get bad news, this person starts to lever up because they think the price is going down. It's gone down too far. They lever up a lot. The problem, of course, is that if, if you keep on getting bad news, they're taking these lever positions. They start losing a lot of money. So they still want to be long, but they're just running out of cash. And pretty quickly, they become almost irrelevant. That logic plays out even more rapidly for someone who's genuinely very bullish who takes an extremely level position from the very start, but then rapidly runs out of money. Conversely, on the downside, you know, even people who are extremely pessimistic, these people start off extremely short. The price goes down, 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 they're making a fortune. And at some point, even they think, you know, oh my God, the, the, the people who are even more, more bearish than me have driven down too fast and they start getting long. Um, and only the very, very extreme people are still short at the end. But at the end, they're extremely rich. And so a very small number of people are then trading against all the rest of the market. But the rest of the market is basically run out of money. <clears throat> so, you know, there's this basically, there's this short term effect of bad news on sentiment. Um, and you can look at things like the risk neutral probability of default as of time zero. This is like a, you can think about this as a price of a credit default swap that pays you a dollar in the bottom side of the world. That's a surprisingly large number given the, you know, the objective the, or the subjective true probability default in the mind of a, of a median investor. Uh, and in a homogeneous economy, this number will be some, some tiny number. And the thing I want to emphasize here is that there's a kind of a dichotomy. There's, there's actually a, a real qualitative separation between the polynomial dependence on time here and the exponential dependence on time here. And this is not dependent on the fact that I assumed, you know, the, the, the uniform belief distribution I assumed just for simplicity. This is true for any finite alpha, so for any beta distribution. Um, and it's also true if, if instead of getting bad news, you get good news. Again, the, 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 the key thing here is that sentiment makes the prices of these very, very extreme securities um, become much, much more valuable. All right. Um, <clears throat> I've got about 15 minutes left. I'm just going to very, very quickly say, um, you can sort of run this example again with one tiny change, which is that instead of the extreme state being bad news, you can have the extreme state being good news. And I kind of think of this as an extremely stylized model of kind of GameStop or something like this. 
where there's lots of states of the world where the thing's extremely boring, and there's one freaky positive state of the world where, in the mind of some of these people, this thing is going to be extremely valuable. All right, so this is what, what we call the bubbly asset. Now, um, we had this general result at the very beginning that I showed you. Um, some point here. Um, the gen this general result says that in, these, in the risky bond case, the price is going to fall as sentiment rises. In the bubbly asset case, the price is going to rise as, as, as disagreement increases. So the first thing, which is not tremendously, which follows straight from that general result, is that sentiment is going to drive the price up when there's some chance of good news. But this is not very surprising given the other result. The thing that's more striking is that the dynamics of the bubble are very, very different than the dynamics of the, of the risky bond. Um, specifically, in the case of the risky bond, you know, the price is driven kind of down early in its life. Uh, so you get this 95, this, this surprisingly low price at time zero. For a bubbly asset, nothing happens at first, or not much happens at first, but the bubble starts to kind of build to a, a peak very late in its life. Volatility is going up as time passes through the bubble. And the weirdest thing of all about this example is the beliefs of the median investor. So if you go back to the risky bond example, and you think about what the median, median investor is thinking as the, as the bond keeps on crashing, from the median investor's perspective, he just thinks that these idiots are driving the price lower and lower and lower, and the expected return is going higher and higher and higher. Now, of course, he doesn't have much money left to, to speculate on that, but he's doing it, he's trying. What happens in the bubbly asset case, which is I find very surprising still, is that initially the median investor is in fact the representative agent, so is, is bullish, hold, holds the asset. Then if you keep on getting good news, optimists pile into the asset, they, drive, they pump up the price, the median investor think it's, thinks it's gone up too high and becomes bearish, so they start shorting it. But right at the height of the bubble, as I'll show you in a second, the media investor changes his mind again a second time, becomes bullish and gets back into the asset just before the bubble resolves. And the, I think the key way, the simplest key way to understand the key asymmetry is just to say that it's the effect of risk aversion. Um, in the case of the risky bond, the effect of risk and risk aversion drives the price down and towards this extreme scenario in the case of the risky bond. But in the case of the bubbly asset, risk inversion drives the price down and away from the good outcome. So in a sense, with the risky bond, it, it's all over more quickly because risk is just pumping, is driving the price down and sentiment is driving the price down. For the bubbly asset, the effect of risk holds people back to some extent so that the bubble develops later in the, in the game. Let me show you some pictures. Um, so, so this is just showing you you know, it's a slightly different example just so that the picture looked nice. Uh, 20 period example. Here's what happens with a risky bond. You get a big discount early in the life of the bond. The discount here is measured as the ratio of the, he the, the, the price in the heterogeneous economy to the price that would prevail if everyone had the same beliefs, the homogeneous belief price. And so the risky bond is cheaper, of course, than the homogeneous case. The bubbly asset is slightly more expensive. So this is a log scale, so it's slightly bigger than one. And the thing that's surprising is that in the case of the bubbly asset, the price kind of accelerates upwards. So it's convex, even on a log scale, until a peak just before the time capital T. And then of course, at time capital T, the, the price is the same in both economies because it's just equal to the payoff. So you get the bubble sort of developing very late in your life. Here's the risk premium that this median person perceives. So initially, the, this is a, on, this is a very small but positive number here. So initially, this person perceives a small positive return, excess return. And it's small, by the way, because there's not much volatility, as I'll show you in a second. Then as time passes, if you keep getting good news, the, he thinks that it's the price is get, the asset's getting pumped up too high, so he, he perceives a negative risk premium. And then just before expiry, as it were, maturity, he switches his mind again. So you get this double crossing of the access, which is so, so strange. Here's what VIX looks like in equilibrium. This is one period VIX. So you're pricing one period ahead VIX in both economies. So in a risky bond case, you know, you get a lot of volatility initially and it sort of declines over time. Bubbly asset case, 
very little volatility, but it rises dramatically during the life of the bubble. And then <clears throat> here's one way to understand why this person, why the median investor switches position twice, so changes his mind twice. So what I'm showing you here is the identity, the black line is the identity of Mr. Market over time if you keep getting good news. So if you keep getting good news, Mr. Market gets more and more bullish. The dashed line is the identity of the person who is in cash. Now, I mentioned briefly on a, a, a few slides ago that the VIX index is a measure in our equilibrium of the gap, the disagreement between these two people. So as VIX is going up, as vol is going up and as the bubble develops, there's going to be a gap opening between these two people. Now, of course, the Mr. Market can't is you know, bounded above by one, so it can't get too optimistic. And so for this to explain this gap, this, this rise in volatility, the identity of Mr. of the cash investor has to bend down in the opposite direction. And what that means is that it actually the person whose identity is 0.5 ends up in the gray zone where they're actually long the risky asset um, at expiry, having been short for most of its life. And similarly, you know, if you're if your h equals 0 0.7, then you're long for a while at the beginning, then you get short for a while, then you get long for a while at the end. So you get this very, very strange dynamics. Okay. Um, I've got about another seven minutes. So I, I guess I will just try to give you a bit of a flavor of, of, of the first sort of ex really extended example that we look at in the paper, which is which is um, a diffusion limit where we just do the Cox Ross Rubenstein thing um, and slice the, 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 the time period from zero to T into lots and lots of very, very short periods um, in the usual way. And so here's what the terminal payoffs look like. This is the payoff at time capital T conditional on M up moves having taken place. This is just, the, this is, there's nothing special here. This is just the Cox Ross Rubenstein payoffs. Now, one thing that you have to be careful about is that when you take this limit, you have to shrink the amount of disagreement over any single step. Because when a step represents like five seconds, it's very hard to have an extremely strong belief about what's going to happen in the next five seconds. So, it, so in, in terms of those pictures I showed you of the beta distributions, what we need to do is to take a limit where the belief distribution is becoming more spiky as we increase the number of time periods. This is the belief, don't forget, about a single tiny time period. And we want to do that in such a way that the kind of beliefs about the whole zero to T are telling some sort of interesting, sensible limit. So what we end up doing is we, we, we parameterize alpha and beta to be proportional to N. So alpha and beta, you remember, these are the things in the, in the beta uh, distribution, the higher they are, the more spiky this distribution is. So as n goes to infinity, alpha and beta go to infinity with it, and this thing becomes very spiky. And you can think then of theta as, as being the key parameter which controls how much disagreement there is. So if theta is small, so alpha and beta are small, then there's relatively more disagreement. If theta is going to infinity, you end up with a homogeneous economy. And so this is going to be the limit where we just get black shards. So in all of our formulas, with theta is infinity, you'll see black shells um, reappearing. Um, and so because we're intentionally shrinking the distribution of H to a kind of point, practically, rather than indexing people by H, I'm going to index people by their Z score. So I'll, I'll refer to H as Z. So you're, if I'm, my Z is zero, then I am the mean agent. If my Z is plus one, then I'm one standard deviation more optimistic than the mean agent. So I can talk about Z instead of, instead of H. Now in the limit, so as N goes to infinity, what you end up with here is just basically a log normal terminal distribution. And in fact, everyone agrees on, on, on that fact. Everyone sees it as log normal and they agree on the volatility. So there's, this thing here is independent of, of Z or of H. Um, and of course, as theta goes to infinity, this thing just goes to sigma, like in black shots. But they disagree on first moments. So they agree on the, on the second moment, they don't agree on the first moment. Um, and we yeah. can carry. Can I jump in? So uh, 
quick question from John George Constantinidis. Uh, what regularities does this model explain and how can I test it? Uh, okay, let, let, me, let, me, let me keep going, because I haven't got- Yeah, 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 and don't worry about the time. So we're not very strict on the time. So you, you have more than enough time. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so, so, we can, so we can then solve you know, everything you might want to solve in this model. Um, and here, for example, is the expected return on the risky asset as perceived by person Z. So again, if you're the mean, if you're the average person, then your Z is equal to zero. Um, you can then think, you can then ask questions like, what is the average, what is the cross-sectional average expected excess return? So this is the quantity that in our minds is the counterpart of when you know Graham and Harvey run surveys where they ask people what they expect, they often report the cross-sectional average for this premium. And so we can we can average this quantity across Z or Z rather uh, to, to calculate the cross-sectional average expected return. We can look at the disagreement by which is, is meant the cross-sectional standard deviation of these expected subjective expected returns that people report and so on. Uh, perhaps more surprisingly, um, we can also do option pricing very nicely in this setting. And what comes out is that is that options they can be priced, you know, in terms of the Black Scholes formula, obviously, as you always can. But the thing that's very striking is that the implied volatility uh, takes a very nice sort of tractable but not trivial form. Uh, and so there's a volatility term structure which emerges in this setting. Um, again, as theta goes to infinity, this thing just tends to sigma. You just recover black shards. But when theta is a finer number, this is something else. It, and there's a volatility term structure because the implied vol and options depends on their, on their maturity. So let me just show you. Here's a sort of snapshot of the what the term structure of vol looks like in this, in this equilibrium. So here we're looking at time zero. These are the implied volatilities and options of all different maturities from zero out to capital T. So by construction, the physical volatility at maturity is just sigma. And that's the definition of sigma effectively. And what sentiment is doing is that in the short run, it's basically it's boosting volatility, it's creating volatility in just the same way that I've showed you in these simple examples before. And then at longer horizons, um, it's also opening up a variance risk premium. So there's a gap where option prices are higher than physical volatility would suggest. Again, as theta goes to infinity, notice that everything collapses to the Black-Scholes case where vol is flat uh, at sigma, and so there's no variance risk premium. Now, I don't think this is really going to answer George's question directly, but I just want to quickly show you one thing you might worry about, you might notice here, is that the same parameter theta, which is basically parameterizing disagreement, is driving all these different, totally different things like average expected excess returns, disagreement, the slope of the volatility term structure, the size of the variance risk premium. Um, and so in principle, you could sort of use any of these things to calibrate the model. And you might worry that if you use one of them, then the model will be horribly wrong in all the others. Um, but just to give you a very simple illustrative calculation to show that the model is not completely crazy um, and out by you know, many orders of magnitude. Uh, you know, here's a very simple, a simple set of numbers that where the model, rough, broadly speaking, sort of roughly matching the data. Um, you know, this is basically taking the same volatility as Campbell Cochrane, essentially, uh, a 10 year horizon, simply because that seems like the sort of horizon length over which things happen that people disagree about and a single value of theta is 1.8 and the model's doing okay. Um, I want to give the important caveat here. Of course, I, I don't like to take this too seriously because our model is exceptionally stylized. You know, it's, it's a, this is a finite horizon model. It's not stationary. Um, it's a model where the world ends after 10 years. Um, but at least it's showing that the model is not sort of crazily off um, on these dimensions. And you can imagine, um, trying to make a richer model uh, match the data quantitatively. It's also very easy, by the way, you, a different interpretation of this model is that it will be nice, you can think about this as being a good model of times like COVID or 
9-11 or Lehman Brothers going bankrupt, when something very dramatic happens and then everyone is freaking out and doesn't know what's going on. And that's time zero when there's lots of disagreement. And if that's your view of how we, you know, maybe that's the right way of thinking about our model, then you should try to calibrate the model to times like those. And there's a very clear feature of times like 9-11 or 2008 or COVID, which is that the short, there's this tremendous spike in the, in the short end of the volatility term structure and volatility term structure becomes extremely damn sloping at these times. And that's a, that's a feature that's very easy for us to, for us to generate in the model. You know, so we also show results in a crisis calibration with more disagreement to a lower value of theta. Uh, so you get lots of short run volatility. You know, in the crisis I mentioned, VIX was on the order of 70%. Um, um, that's easy for a model to generate that sort of sharply down sloping volatile structure. Now, um, you know, I'm going to skip this. Um, Let me um, let me tell you a bit about about um, I mean, one of the things we want to do in this model is to really understand what is going on in the minds of the investors inside the model to try to use that as a sort of you know intuition pump hopefully for suggesting empirical exercises people might do. So it, in our setting, people use extreme in this diffusion model, people are using extremely complicated trading strategies to speculate. Um, and these strategies are going to induce different wealth returns for each investor as a function of what turns out to happen to the market. Now, you can think about things either in dynamically, in time series terms, like, you know, characterizing strategies as being sort of contrarian, like, you know, sell if it goes down, so, sorry, sell if the market rallies, buy if it crashes. Or you can think about things in sort of derivatives terms, you know, like sell options or short bond. And so I've described these, so that th these strategies are supposed to be equivalent. And so these are sort of essentially equivalent, these two things in brackets. Um, and it turns out that we can do everything again in closed form in this diffusion model. Um, there's going to be a particularly interesting investor that we, we, we think about a lot, who we call the gloomy investor, who is a particular investor whose Z is equal to some this thing here, this quantity. So this is someone, this is negative. So it's someone who's less, who's more pessimistic than the mean investor. And this is, we think this is the, uh, I don't know if you've read Winnie the Pooh recently, but uh, this is sort of like the Eeyore figure, the little donkey, the depressed donkey. Um, and this person turns out to be quite important for characterizing what, what these people are doing. Um, so here's a sort of horrible looking expression, but nonetheless, it's basically a simple closed form expression for the return on any agent's return on wealth given that they're doing this very complicated dynamic strategy. Turns out we can completely characterize their return. And there are two things that are relevant. So the thing in red here is, is what we call the target return. What you, if you look at this expression, you'll see that this is the ideal outcome. So the best thing that can possibly happen for person Z is that R0T is equal to KZ. Now this is a quantity that we can, this is the target return. We can, we can express this in terms of the basic model parameters. But I think it's clearer to just to show you a different expression that satisfies, satisfies this relationship here. So what this is saying is that let's suppose you are an extremely optimistic person. So Z is very positive, a large, big number. Then the ideal outcome for you, KZ, is actually higher than what you expect to happen because this thing here is positive. So if you're an extremist, you want the market to move even more than you expect. On the downside, if you're very, very pessimistic, so Z is negative, Z is negative, you would like the market to move down even more than you expect. And if you happen to be this sort of Eeyore figure, Z equals Z, ZG, then this is zero. This is, so the Eeyore person wants to be proved right. So the best thing that can happen is that they're proved right, and it could be. Okay, so we can, we can, we can then track all the different you know, outcomes from all these different people. Um, one thing that, one implication of this, is that basically everyone has a, if you look at this, this, this function here, everyone in equilibrium has a maximum ideal outcome beyond which you start to get less happy. And what that means is that every investor has a U-shaped SDF. 
Right, so there are lots of different ways of understanding this. One way is as I've described it through spec to the, 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 the equilibrium and wealth return strategies. Another way you could describe it is by looking at the properties of option prices, and we do that in the paper as well. It turns out basically that, that you know, it, somewhat intuitively, extremists pump up the prices of options, of out-of-the-money options. So if you're the median investor, you think that out-of-the-money calls are tremendously overvalued. Right? So the only way that you can rationalize them is by having it, you know, that, that, that's, that says that the, the, uh, that's what generates this U-shaped um, SDM. Okay, I guess the final thing I'll have time to mention probably is I'm just going to say something about sharp ratios and I'm going to try and beat up on the whole idea of sharp ratios and alpha and all the things that empirical asset prices do, which don't make any sense in our equilibrium. So, because everything is complete, lock is complete, um, and because we have these nice log investors, we can then easily infer every investor's. SDF in equilibrium. And they all have different SDFs because they all see the same prices, but they have different beliefs. So though the market's complete, every investor has a different SDF. Now, once you've got the SDF in your hand, as it were, you can just use Hans and Anthony to make inferences about the maximum attainable sharp ratio. So using Hans and Anthony, we can work out what investor Z thinks the maximum sharp ratio is. Now, of course, how do you attain that sharp ratio? Well, you have to trade dynamically. So this is the maximum sharp ratio attainable through dynamic trade. You can also look, and we do look, at the sharp ratio of the market itself. And I'll show you that in a second. But it's, it's kind of nice and easy to characterize the maximum sharp ratio uh, of, every, of any investor. And again, this kind of gloomy investor person turns out to be the person who perceives the lowest maximum sharp ratio. But even this person, perceives what turned out to be a very kind of a high sharp, a big number. And in fact, if theta is less than one, which it can be, everyone in this economy perceives that infinitely high sharp ratios are attainable. So this figure here does not assume theta is less than one, it assumes theta is 1.8, as in the uh, calibrated example I gave you before. And so the dotted line is showing you what different people, Z, perceive as the max sharp ratio that you can attain. And you can see that sort of reasonable people perceive normal levels of sharp ratios, but as soon as you get even a little bit optimistic, they perceive these astonishingly high sharp ratios. You can also calculate in simple closed form the, the sharp ratio of the market itself, a static sharp ratio. And of course, that's less than a dynamic sharp ratio. And then finally, you can look at what the sharp ratio is on the strategies that people actually choose, again in closed form. And that doesn't look much like either of these things. So this is just to emphasize that the sharp ratio, the max sharp ratio, is not of tremendous interest to these people. Now, nonetheless, you can still look in equilibrium at what these max sharp ratio strategies look like <clears throat> using the results of Hansen and Richard. And so again, closed form. Uh, what I'm showing you here on a log scale, the solid lines are the strategies that people choose. The dotted lines are the strategies that you would, you would choose if you wanted to, to maximize your sharp ratio. And what you can see is that these max sharp ratio strategies are extremely scary. They're basically extremely short, deep out of the money options. They're these terrifying strategies with unboundedly negative returns. Um, so they're mean very efficient. In theory, you could use these for beta pricing and zero alphas, but they're totally uninteresting for our investors. And in fact, our investors wouldn't even want to put epsilon money into one of these high sharp ratio strategies because they're extraordinarily tail risky. Um, and so in other words, you know, alphas and sharp ratios in our, in our economy just make no sense. They're not of economic interest to our investors at all. And moreover, the reason that they're of no economic interest, I think is very plausible in reality, which is that they are extremely tail risky and they load up on things that people don't actually want to take uh, in reality. Um, so that's sort of a view as a cautionary tale for just uncritically reading empirical asset pricing papers and thinking that an alpha of X, whatever, whatever, or a sharp ratio of two is a big number. This means it's a, a desirable strategy in some sense. No, it just, um, it's not necessarily attractive at all for, for an investor. Okay, sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you for letting me go over a bit, um, but I'm gonna skip the other stuff. Uh, actually, let me say one final thing. Um, we also do some, it's kind of 
fun. We can play around with asking what, whether people think speculation is a good idea. And so what happens in equilibrium is that everyone thinks it's a, it's a bad idea for agri for so, socially harmful, but everyone likes it for themselves because they think that everyone else is an idiot. So this is an economy where everyone agrees that speculation is socially harmful, but good news for, for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very interesting presentation, very interesting model. I'll uh, let our guests uh, unmute themselves and ask questions. In the meantime, while everybody is uh, digesting all of this rich, uh, all these rich implications, I, I, I have a, you know, a detailed question, so maybe it's, uh, but so it's, you, the log utility is sufficient to get to your, you know, beautiful, tractable and, and whatnot. It, it also seemed very necessary, but, you know, maybe I'm kind of wrong, right? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so no, 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 no. I, I think, I think, I mean, for, for the way that we do it, um, I think it is very necessary. Yeah. For all, to be able to characterize all the things that we do, like the fit, I mean, sorry, but VIX and everything along the dynamics of it. Yes, it does seem that, to be necessary. That's very fair. So the, the, the only kind of little question I had with, with regard to that is it felt a bit like as soon as you would go out of this myopic setup, uh, heterogeneity would kind of build in path dependencies that might look like behavioral biases, but that would just arise from the path dependencies that are created in your kind of being exposed to different kind of shocks that are, you know, changing your your position with respect to the rest the the rest of the economy, right? Or the the you know, as, as you're just you are not changing your age, but your age is changing its its value with respect to kind of the the the, the median investor or the representative in, uh, investor, right? So, uh, do you do you think that? we could gain insights about these kind of kind of uh, you know yeah i mean I, I i think things will get very complicated so they to do i mean so there's a as you say there's a paper by atmas and bashak where they do stuff with power utility and so they managed to make quite a lot of progress in the diffusion case with power utility so they price the asset with power utility um, so you should go to that paper because they don't do lots of the other things we do. Um, but I think to, to take our approach directly, it, it is going to be very difficult with power utility because yeah, you get you know all the kind of well-known non-myopic intertemporal problems are extremely hard in general. Um, of course, we have a complete market, so there's, there's, there's um, that brings in all sorts of tools that one might use. I, I personally, I like, I, I like log utility for two reasons. One is that I think people do behave reasonably myopically for a start as a, you know, of, of the many very crude assumptions we're making in this kind of model, that's one that I don't worry about so much in a sense. Uh, um, people are not completely myopic, but they seem to me to be roughly myopic. I don't often hear that many conversations with people in practice about their intertemporal hedging practices. Maybe I'm just hanging out with the wrong people. <laughs> um, um, but I feel that the kind of, certainly if you read the, the, the financial press, the sort of the financial times and something like that, they really do not talk about this stuff much. Um, that's one reason. Another reason is that I like it because of this uh, my other work where it seems as though looking at log investors seems to work remarkably well for things like forecasting terms on stocks or the market or currencies. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, I think, you know, the, the kind of things that I'm, more, the dimension which I would more want to specialize as not, not for extend the model, I think there's a lot of, well, one would be, it would be nice to have a stationary model where things, you know, there's some Poisson process, things arrive, big shocks happen, the plaintiff, the World Trade Center, the bank goes bankrupt. And then this sort of initiates what we, just, what we have here. In a way, what we have in this model is like an account of a single market episode, mm. rather, than a, rather than a full stationary model that you could really seriously try to take to the data. 
quantitatively. Um, the other dimension, which I think is kind of cool, is the idea of having multi-dimensional disagreement. Because actually, and I think in some ways you see this in the world in general at the moment, the ways in which people disagree with each other, there are all these very complicated in like politics and everything, realignments that reflect, you know, the old you know, economic versus social, cultural uh, preferences or beliefs or whatever. I think you can get very interesting dynamics coming out of a model like this with the even two-dimensional disagreement. I think, and I'm playing around with that at the moment, which is what Demetrius and I are playing around with this at the moment. And I think there's a lot of very cool things. Because then there's an element of, mod it's almost like you have beliefs about the model that relates to these different dimensions. Um, um, and then I guess the thing I would really like to get away from, in a sense, but which any model of this type is subject to is, nothing genuinely surprising happens at a binomial tree. Right, that's, that's all this, you know, diffusions that, you know, there's a, there's a book by, I think, Kvitanich and Karatsas, where they start out by saying that nothing surprising happens in a world of diffusions. Um, and they, they say that, and then they write a book about, you know, <laughs> with, with this, in, in that sense, I think that's something which is really missing in this model, which is really present in the real world. Jumps like proper jumps. We, we, I didn't discuss today, but we do have a model of jumps in this in a different Poisson limit. But there, the size of a jump that happens is known, and so you can sort of, so it's basically a complete market still. So it captures some of the jumps up, but it doesn't really capture something which is totally unexpected. And I think that's an important thing in reality, and it's hard to know how to model that. So that's a very speculative thing, but that's. That is more than the log utility. I think that kind of thing is the sort of thing that I would like to break. Uh, Ian, uh, Steve Figlewski here. Um, I, I, we're running out of time, and, uh, but I really want to jump in and say, this is a fantastic paper. This is a paper that I wanted some people to write for years. And I'm sure that when I get a chance to read the paper carefully, I'll like it even more because it, for example, you left out the learning aspect of it, which is fantastic. Um, there are a couple of a couple of points that I wanted to make for everybody on this one. Uh, one is that you've managed to combine a market where you get payoffs based on changes in the market price, but to limit it, uh, that you have exogenous payoffs at the end. Mm -hmm. And so this has always been a kind of a challenge uh, uh, in these kinds of heterogeneous expectations models, because it has to be a, an endpoint where you actually learn the, the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I think that model, the model that you've got, uh, applies very much to something like a futures market or an options market or any kind of zero net supply kind of market. I think that's important that, that, that there's a, an end point but you've been able to get really interesting results. It's a fantastic result that you've got agents that in the intermediate time trade against their beliefs. I, that's fantastic. I, I love that. Um, I would say one thing that you use the word sentiment and yet it's really more heterogeneity that's driving everything. People, sentiment is, you know, is like you know, risk aversion. Well, you could double everybody's risk aversion in this model and it come out the same, I think. So somehow sentiment isn't really risk aversion. In fact, it's not, a, it's not an individual property at all. It's, it's, it's sentiment is like the heterogeneity across the market. I mean, it's true that in a sense, our people are very level-headed individually. Uh, in the case with no learning, they just have exactly the same beliefs all the time. I guess the sense in which there's sentiment is that there's kind of the Mr. Market person the guy that I imagine the financial journalist goes to talk to is the person with the cash. And the identity of that person is moving around over time. The Buffett, Buffettian, or, or, or I guess it was, was it, um, ben, Benjamin Graham, I guess, probably, technically. That Mr. Market figure is, is someone who's, whose identity is, is like in flux, basically. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the sense which I think is the sense of it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, indeed. I mean, another thing that one might slightly pessimistically want to change about this model is that our people, at least, although they've got these different beliefs, they're very rational people. They're doing the right thing. They're not dumb. In right. some way. And, and probably in reality, that's maybe a little too kind. To, <laughs> you know, there are a few people who aren't so smart. I mean, 
even conditional on their beliefs are doing stupid things basically which is really not in our model um and you know i like rational models but even i would concede that there are probably some no, I like, I like that very much. There's one point that I want everybody to know, which is we've spent at least in these seminars over the, over the last year or so, probably half of them have been involved in trying to explain how we don't get a monotonic uh, stochastic discount factor. Now we got a model, which I've always thought was the answer really, but we lack the tractable model. We got a model that now explains, and I think this is where it comes from, honestly, in the real world. So well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I'm regretting, I should have, should, I didn't, should, I actually skipped the picture, which would have kind of explained that a little better. But yeah, there's, um, there's just a big gap in this, in this world between the pricing of like deep out of the money options, for example. They just look completely different to how they would look in a homogeneous world. You know, so this picture is showing the risk premium you would get in a homogeneous world on calls, like out of the money calls. You know, if rationally priced in the homogeneous world, they're, they're levered, they're levered claims on the market, so they have extremely high risk premium. Now, in our setting, if you ask the median person what he or she thinks the expected return on the ad for my call is, he'll actually say it's negative because he thinks these crazy people are, are, are pumping the prices up so much. And so, in that sense, it's not surprising that you want to sell a few of those options that are so overpriced on the upside, and then you end up with this. This wealth return, which ends up ultimately going back down to zero, if in some freaky scenario, if the price goes too high, yeah, you you end up end up uh, not doing as well as you might have hoped, and so that's why the SDF goes comes back and goes goes, goes positively slipped. Yeah, thank thank you for those comments. It's really good. it's really great to hear. Yeah, that was uh, indeed very uh, positive and generous feedback. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we're almost a quarter to two already, uh, Eastern Standard Time. So uh, we'll take this offline if you want to continue.